It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, with me is my co-host, Andy Grabner. Hey, Andy, how are you doing today? Hey, uh, well, actually, good as, well, actually, why do I say actually good as every time when we have a conversation, right? It would be sad otherwise. That's why I uh, I feel good. Everything good? You know, that just put a thought in my head about, like, sad Andy, um, you sitting <laughs> in your office with a tear rolling down your cheek and... and yeah, I'm gonna have to figure out how to get a picture of Sad Andy. I love the. Uh, I think it's a tr- terrible, tragic concept of Sad Andy, but I think it would be, it would be awesome. I think in the Slack channels or something else, if somebody did something that was not right to do, um, it would be good to put a picture of Sad Andy as a reaction. So I'll have to work on that. <laughs> Thank you for the idea, yeah. Andy. Anyway, and, Andy, so so we're recording a podcast, eh? Hey? Yeah, and it seems that uh, you know, even though we, I think we're not that funny, but it seems somebody finds it funny, and maybe that person just you know wants to jump in right away and introduces yourself. Who is laughing in the background here? Well, hi to both of you. This is Priyanka Sharma. I serve as director of Cloud Native at GitLab. GitLab is the first single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, and yeah, I'm the person laughing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? You guys are really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get, I don't hear that very often. I, I try to be funny, but most people, most people say, hey, you have dad jokes and that's it. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, should... I'm one of those people who are like a big fan of dad jokes. So here we are. <laughs> Hey, thanks for for jumping on the show. And I think before we kicked off the recording, we just you know had a quick chat. And I think I was reminded mm-hmm. when we met, we met at reInvent uh, 2018 in November. And I saw mm-hmm. you on stage presenting there in the expo area. And uh, after that, I was really, I was really excited about you know what what you showed, uh, how you are. How, we have, how you are promoting cloud native software engineering and how that's supposed to be done. And I know that a lot of people came over to you asking you questions and, and what is this all about and how does this really work. So I thought today we want to get you on the podcast and talk about what cloud native really means, especially for large enterprise mm-hmm. organizations, which I believe a lot of our listeners are, are working for representing because cloud native, obviously, okay. besides the whole marketing topic, uh, the, the marketing term, mm-hmm. uh, there, there's really a lot to it. But there's also, I think, a lot of questions, uh, especially for enterprises that need to figure out what does it mean for them. And and so I want to okay. actually throw it to you. What do you see out there? What do you what gets people excited about cloud native? And and what are the challenges that they run into? What's what what what's what's happening? Sure, absolutely. Um, so cloud native. When you hear the term these days, um, and big enterprises are discussing it, there's uh, I, I I notice two emotions. One is excitement, and the other is trepidation. Now, the excitement comes from all the promise that cloud native holds, all the stories we've heard of digital transformation, of much faster delivery, of being responsive to the market, all those great things, right? And obviously, any good leader would want that for his or her organization. So that's the excitement piece. The trepidation comes from knowing that most large enterprises are um, managing wieldy, an unwieldy, bulky software, and they know um, their processes may be, you know, um, maybe a little solidified over the last decades, if not years. So the trepidation comes from, well, this cloud native thing sounds really great. It means I can stay more react- responsive to my business and affect the bottom line positively. But can I really get there? How do I get there? And many of us, as we've gone through the journey, have made mistakes on the way, learned from them. Um, but sometimes people can uh, feel burnt. So I think that's what, in a nutshell, I'd say people are experiencing mm-hmm. uh, based on what I, my conversations have been like. Mm-hmm. And would you say, so I think, obviously, cloud native, um, I don't know who coined the term and, and, and how long it's been around. But uh, obviously, there have been companies doing cloud native before we had the fancy term of cloud native, right? As you said, these are the people that are that tried out this new 
sets of technology and then uh, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, and so in your own experience, and, and obviously you are representing a company, you're working for GitLabs. Um, I, I assume you have probably been, you, you consider, you have to consider yourself one of the early adopters of that technology, learning from experience, learning, making the mistakes that others, you know, have, have made as well or are about to do. Um, is this a, co a correct assumption that you, I will probably assume you are one of the first early adopters and now with also bringing a product to the market that helps people on, on building software in a more modern way? Um, yes. So GitLab is definitely a cloud native company. We're just like every cloud native company, we are on mm -hmm. um, a journey towards cloud native. I don't, I think it's a process and a mindset as opposed to Okay, I did A, B, and C, and now I'm cloud native. You know what I mean? Um, and mm -hmm. that experience ourselves actually has really been useful in developing the empathy that we have towards our customers um, as they go through the process. Because um, often, you know, if we look back at the history of cloud native, it really all like everything starts with cloud compute, right? And mm -hmm. uh, the start, the coming of AWS, I guess. 10 years ago now or something um, was what kicked off this movement where you didn't need, you didn't need your own servers anymore no server farm necessary to build a big business um, and with that with that paradigm shift came an opportunity to build software differently because suddenly provisioning was just faster and easier um, and that, those technologies the, that the way of building those, that way of building technology where you can move faster, you can break out pieces and uh, empower developers to run quickly. That is the core of the cloud native way, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, before everybody got excited about it, uh, the large web scale companies were definitely the trailblazers here, right? When we think about the Googles, the Netflix, the, um, and the Twitters of the world. And that's where if we notice we get a lot of our uh, experts from today because these people built cloud cloud natively before cloud and cloud native was a thing um, and so there's a lot we can learn from them however their experiences are different from that of you know uh, enterprises out there just the scale is different the um, the expertise is different and so GitLab having you know gone through the uh, cloud native journey ourselves, it helps us be really empathetic towards the end user. And I think that's why we have over 100,000 organizations uh, using and contributing to GitLab. Can, can you repeat that again? How many organizations do you have to contribute? Um, more than 100,000 organizations use and many of them contribute to GitLab. That, that's that, that's quite an achievement, I would say. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty big number, yeah? <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So now in the... So so that's great, right? And you, you, you walked you know, through the transformation, we at Dynatrace, you know, we also had our transformation that we've been, we've been talking uh, about, you know, in, in several episodes here and people that, you know, follow what we've been doing, they, they know our kind of transformation, the way we said we went from classical enterprise, uh, six months uh, delivery cycles to now we deploy constantly uh, in in production, uh, we run both, you know, in the cloud, but also on premise for those customers that still want us on premise. So the um, the, the the big question though that people always ask us, and now I want to throw it to you, is, and you kind of alluded into this earlier. Now, I, I I'm if I'm a big enterprise company and I have a lot of legacy applications and I have a legacy mindset. How do I how do I get started? What's the what's the best way to uh, to kind of get into a cloud native mindset? What's what's your what's your proposal? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm, I, this question actually reminds me of a panel I did at KubeCon uh, Seattle last year um, with end users, um, enterprise leaders from T-Mobile, Lyft, Delta, and CVS, and that was the question there, like. How do you get started? What is the best way to move quickly, learn, and keep going? And really, it comes down to the advice, and I'm channeling those folks here right now. The advice is that start incrementally. Don't get overwhelmed by all the various things that could be cloud native, all the various tools you could possibly get. Uh, sit back and think through your strategy. There is no rush. 
there is no reason to get this done today in like a hasty manner versus tomorrow in a well done manner. Um, so the first thing that we think about when cloud natives comes, right? Like the first challenge I would say, if someone were starting today specifically, is that if you look at the landscape, it's extreme of like all the tools that are available for cloud native um, way of operations. There's a lot. <laughs> mm. I mean, you just need to go to the, any KubeCon or any AWS and look at the number of vendors that are displaying over there. Many people sound exactly the same as their next neighbor. And um, there's this, you know, we're at this time of peak confusion where you have all these open source projects, all these companies, they're all offering ways to make it easier to operationalize a cloud native workflow. But there's so many. It's like, you know, the paradox of choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be really overwhelming for companies. Also, most large companies, they're, you know, you don't know as a leader, enterprise leader, you don't know exactly what every team is doing. And many have set up their own tool chains in uh, some kind of cloud native way of development. Somehow, maybe it's half baked, maybe it's well done, but different teams within your org will be at different levels of maturity. So, my personal opinion is that cloud native is critical for. Uh, as a business objective, because it's going to make you competitive in the market, or make if you if you're not shipping fast and reducing cycle time, you'll you'll not survive. But at the same time, there's so many because operationalizing it is different from operationalizing large monoliths. Um, so many projects and uh, companies came to the fore that now it's you know, more confusing about what the right thing to do is. So in this world, I think. As a large company, it behooves enterprises to think through what kind of tooling they want to put in place. Um, this is because ultimately for cloud native workflows to work, right? You need a, a system that allows for um, visibility, which means it's easy for any team member to know what's going on in a certain project without having to ask many people, without having to check with a lot of people. They should just be able to click, click, no. And then there's the ease of collaboration. Like people shouldn't be waiting for handoffs. That's sort of the whole point of cloud native, right? That people can operate asynchronously. Um, and so the tooling though, will need to enable that. And then there's a the third piece, which is that you need unified guardrails so that people aren't stressed when they're um, shipping fast about accidentally breaking some rules or, you know, shipping code that may not be fully baked. So there's these three elements, I'll repeat again, the, the, ability, the visibility that teammates need of what's going on in, in the entire company or organization, the ease of collaboration, which is necessary to truly be cloud native and uh, unblock people. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third, which is you need to set the right guardrails for the entire company. So there's no confusions and people feel empowered to move quickly. So I recommend enterprise leaders to think through these three key things they need when they set up their tooling. Now, a challenge they'll probably face is that different teams have different tools already in place. And so there does need to be a little bit of a recon exercise of what's going on and how do we streamline all this. Everyone's culture is different, so um, I wouldn't be prescriptive here on what they should do. However, there's uh, many different tactics people have taken. Some people have had internal hackathons where teams convince each other of which tooling is best. Some people establish tool teams that have a set of guidelines. Uh, there are many ways to do this. And uh, uh, knowing your organization, you'll be able to decide what fits your culture best. Um, and so then, that, so that's the consolidation of your tool chain piece. Um, and then finally, the third piece is really training your workforce because I'm sure... Um, uh, you guys have probably seen this in Dynatrace as well and your customers that um, different engineering divisions, teams will have different levels of comfort with cloud native and some folks need more training than others. And the answer is not to forget about them, <laughs> but yeah. rather to harness their energy. And so I've heard, again, channeling that panel at KubeCon, uh, the folks at T-Mobile and Delta give particularly good examples of running dojos in their organization online and in person where people can up-level their skills. A really interesting thing that I think it was Brendan A. from T-Mobile who mentioned, he's like, the one thing you have to become okay with, even when you provide all kinds of training, 
is that there'll be some people who don't want to learn this new way. It's not for them. And the best you can do is explain the critical importance, the value, and how it will up-level their career. But you have to understand that some folks don't want to do it, and you have to make the right business decisions accordingly while supporting people as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you made an interesting point there too. With um, you know, I'm I'm going to try to extrapolate a little from what you said there. One of the things I hear often when people talk about you know cloud native and, and this whole modern CI/CD pipelining and all this is the idea of providing autonomy to these small development teams that each development team should be able to do whatever they want to get out what they want. However, when we start talking enterprise grade, as you mentioned, there needs to be some guardrails. There needs to be some organization of what is used because everything, all the different teams at some point or at some juncture somewhere are going to have to be able to fit in together. Um, So that means the tooling is going to have to be compatible. You might want to have, and I love the idea of of the hackathon to show off which tools are best, right? And and try to get people together because we have a similar situation. And Andy, correct me if it's changed and all, but I remember when we uh, talked to Anita last, um, the way we had it is Anita and her team run the entire uh, pipeline and decide on all the tooling. Anytime someone new comes on board or a new team starts working on a new project, here's the tooling, here's how you do everything. But if they have a specific requirement that is not covered by the tool set, they might say, hey, this tool would cover it. That team will take and then review it, figure out how to integrate it. And, and there's a process behind it because it's, again, we're, we're talking enterprise. This might not apply to a startup, something small where you really just need to crank things out. But once you start getting to that level, you, you still want to have the idea of the autonomy and some of the autonomy to explore, but a controlled autonomy, let's say maybe. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, what is the purpose of the autonomy? The the purpose of autonomy is to unleash the creativity, to help people be free to ship application logic, to ship code as fast as they want to, as, um, you know, and build the coolest things. The autonomy to do that is going to come with a little bit of standardization on the tooling because that will make your shipping faster. (laughs) The reviews will go faster. Everybody will be on the same page. The collaboration will be easier. So it all really works. It feels counterintuitive really when you begin to think about it, but it actually enables the autonomy to have some standardization on your tool chain. Yeah. Um, You, I mean, there's a lot of, well, thanks of all, first of all, for a lot of great points on how to get started. And I'm sure, so you mentioned KubeCon in a panel, I assume, if people want to watch this, uh, it's probably, I think KubeCon is one of the conferences that are posting uh, all the recordings probably on YouTube or somewhere. So we should probably put a link uh, to the uh, podcast proceedings later on uh, for people that want to watch it. Absolutely. There's there's a video. There's also a blog post. So it's very well yeah. covered. <laughs> so in your, let me ask you a question now. If, if we look at the enterprises, that means obviously we all would like you know, companies to consolidate the tools and basically consolidate it down to the tools that we offer, right? In your case, it's GitLab. In our case, it is Dynatrace. And, and it would be a perfect world for us vendors. But in theory, but in, in the reality, obviously, it looks different, right? The reality looks like there's so many tools out there. Certain ones can be consolidated. Certain ones can't be consolidated. This is where integration then obviously fits in. Um, how do you... How do you integrate though? And do you, I'm not sure if you have an answer for this, but how do we go about integrating tools that have completely different, not the mindsets, but not sure what the right word for this is, but tools that have been built for completely different architectures for, con- to support completely different processes, uh, a completely different mindset. Can we integrate all the tools or are there certain scenarios where you say, well, you know, certain things cannot be, brought over the new cloud native way. You better stay where you are and then we build the new cool stuff with cloud native and then maybe we find a middle way where we have some integration portal or whatever you want to call it. So my question to you is uh, how do we how can we how can we integrate these these let's say more legacy environments, legacy tools with the new cl- cool cloud native stuff? Is there a, um, a good answer? Can we do it for all? Or are there certain things where you say, well, maybe not. Maybe you better stay where you are. Fair question. So I'll answer it from the perspective that I know, which is the GitLab perspective. Um, I will mm-hmm. also speak to, um, so my background, just so you know, is in observability. So before GitLab, I spent a lot of time working on the open tracing project with the 
CNCF. Um, so I, I, I'm big into tracing. Um, so I will address it from the GitLab perspective and then also a few thoughts from that observability mindset. Mm -hmm. So uh, at uh, I hear you that some things, <laughs> you know, how can you uh, bring it all in in one nice, perfect bow wrap thing? And the answer is, it's not so easy, right? Otherwise, everybody would have done it already and we'd be on to the next. Um, what we have noted, like, as you know, uh, GitLab focuses on being the single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. And because our customers are such large companies, as well as startups, but because we also have the really large organizations, by nature, a bunch of their software development has in the past been legacy. And some of it continues to be that today, right? And the value of being of developing everything in one place with GitLab and then adding in the you know, two, three other tools that may be necessary. So, um, for example, let's say someone is a heavy Jira shop. They don't have to use GitLab's planning, even though they could, and they would probably like it. <laughs> um, but they can integrate that, and now the ticketing is all in sync with your version control and CICD and et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't matter whether the ticketing is about a legacy system or a modern system. The point is it's all in one place. And so those key like starting points, right? Like where is your planning happening? Where is your version control? Is it connected? And oh, your CICD, which are really the building blocks, right? These are... Um, I wouldn't call them sharp tools. I would call them mini ecosystems that mm -hmm. you need when you're doing software development. So connecting these big pieces, I think, takes people a long way in that vision I told you, which is of visibility, efficiency, um, and guardrails. So that would be the first thing, that I do believe that the large pieces can be put together. Now, mm -hmm. beyond that, there comes the story of like very specific use cases um, particularly when it's post-production, such as monitoring or, you know, for debugging and all that. Now I'll put my observability and open tracing hat on. And from that world, I would say that it's true that there might be some particular problem that, let's say, um, you can only solve with tracing, right? Like you need to understand the set of transactions and you have traces for it. And let's say they lie in Denetrace or uh, they lie in, I don't know, Jaeger Traces, which is uh, an open source project by Uber. In that scenario, I would say if that is the only thing that is solving your problem, keep it, but keep an eye on when consolidation happens. The one thing to know is that this space is moving really fast in terms of that con consolidation story. So two years ago, I didn't think there would be, uh, there wasn't much from the cloud providers at all around traces, for example, and now, um, or like at least it wasn't at all popular. And then within the last year, AWS X-Ray, um, Stack Driver Trace from Google, also open census from Google, <laughs> like a lot of things have come out, right? So everybody's trying to create their like fortress of tools and make you commit to them. But uh, so consolidation will be easier with each passing month. But if there is a specific tool that's solving a very specific problem and doing it really well, keep it, you know, uh, and maybe only the new people are using it. And maybe the legacy folks still rely most heavily on logs. Um, that doesn't mean they should stop using logs because it's working well for them and efficiency is important. But the slow transition towards a consolidated thing that will work for more people than not is, I think, the guiding light. Mm -hmm. That's um, so. I, I honestly, I didn't know that you were uh, that engaged with uh, open observability and open tracing. We've just uh, we've just joined. Uh, you know, I call it uh, uh, that movement as well uh, because we are you know contributing to that because we also believe that you know we have to in the in the world we're moving towards. Uh, we need to have open standards for uh, for tracing and monitoring through all different types of stakes, right? I mean, as you said, you know, you may end up having some Dynatrace agents, some new Relic agents, some Jaeger, some whatever it is. Um, and and just because you have one team that decided for this tool versus another tool, uh, this should not be the reason why you don't have your end-to-end -end visibility, which you obviously need, right? As you said earlier, the key thing is visibility. Um, and if you don't get visibility, if it's broken, um, and uh, then this is something we need to fix. So uh, It's a problem, exactly, yeah. exactly.
Yeah, no, I've I've spent a lot of time in observability. Now I might not be as current as you are, since um, lately my involvement has mostly been with the uh, the Jaeger project in terms of documenting and end user use cases and stuff. Um, but yes, I'm very familiar, and I, I know your CTO Eloi does a lot mm-hmm. to further the standardization. There's a lot going on, and I just for the sake of the <laughs> end users, I really hope we all start. Um, consolidating the ecosystem fast. Yeah. Pretty cool. Hey, I want to go back to, um, to uh, you know, I mean, cloud native for me, when I hear it, it's also kind of synonymous to we're developing something on Kubernetes, right? I mean, <laughs> at least that seems to be. I mean, that's fair. Right? That's, fair. that's fair. Now, I've, yeah. I've, I've a, I have love Kubernetes the more and more I play with it, but I also have a challenge with it. Like today, I was uh, deploying one of our open source projects that we have on, on EKS and there, for that I provisioned an EKS cluster and I used a Terraform script and now it's running and it, I had to add a couple of nodes to it. And in the beginning, I didn't know how large the nodes need to be. I deployed the app, it didn't work. I added larger EC2 instances until eventually the app actually ran. And, and, and then I said, from a development perspective, it's fine. Now I can write my code, I can run my pipelines, I deploy. But what I really lose and actually come back to the visibility is I lose the visibility or the knowledge what actually happens behind the scenes and how and 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 uh, how I how I as a developer can actually now perfectly write an application that perfectly leverages the resources underneath. So it seems we are building all this with with cloud native with all these abstraction layers where it's really super easy to write a new microservice and uh, deploy it. And then, and the platform magically take care of it. And maybe I have some pipelines that, you know, at, at least do some security checks, some functional checks, maybe some performance checks. But, but I, I feel, and Brian, this goes back to the, the to the recording we had last week. So last week we had a recording, uh, and this, this obviously will would have aired probably two weeks before this one airs, uh, with a gentleman Conrad who was. Uh, explaining the differences between uh, the memory management of the JVM and the .NET runtime. And he said in .NET, because he's an expert on .NET, uh, he said in uh, Microsoft and the .NET team uh, it wants developers to become performance aware developers so they understand how the platform is actually handling memory management and therefore write optimized code so that your code can optimally run on the underlying platform. Now, to kind of make my point, do we have something? Do we have something for Kubernetes? Do we have something for cloud native where we say, in order for you to not only write a microservice that is deployed very super fast and it's out there, this is the way how you write your cloud native apps so that they, A, you know, obviously adhere to the you know, to security, to performance, but also really leveraging in a perfect way, in an optimal way, the underlying resources. Because I fear that if we if we don't know what's actually happening within the frameworks and with, within these you know clusters, that we may end up writing cool software fast, but in the end we're all kind of uh, surprised about the costs that we have. Because I was really surprised the large EC2 instances that I had to add to my Kubernetes cluster to get our very simple app running. Right, right. I, I see what yeah. you're saying. So um, I'll speak to it from my, and I, I do not claim to be an expert in this particular area, but I'll speak to it from my perspective. So, I, I mean, getting developers to be performance aware is awesome. That's the whole point of DevOps, right? Um, but I would say, like, getting them to think about um, application performance is a big win in itself to get them to start thinking about all the compute details also it, it may be a little bit of a like a big cha- big task right <laughs> because i mean i'm sure you you folks have the experience too that like just the move from dev to devops when it comes to application performance and that's something dynatrace deal, deals with regularly um, is in, in in itself a challenge so then when you add in um, people having to think through um, you know the compute issues and all that beyond the regular budgeting guidelines, et cetera. It's like one more level of overhead for developers. And Mm -hmm. the question is, like, is that doable, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one just like 
point I would like to make. And like the, the answer may be, yes, it's totally doable and everyone's doing it. And I just don't know. That could totally be it. But I'll just, that was my reaction to that thought. Now, um, in terms of standardizing, though, this again, everything comes back to standardizing. I think service meshes can really help. So as I'm sure you know, um, things like Envoy. Envoy is not a full service mesh, they say, but you know, it's a reverse. It's, it's, it just doesn't have the control plane. Um, anyway, so like Linkerd, uh, Istio, et cetera. The whole point of using something like all these services together is to standardize the way um, uh, the networking happens for your services and then um, also to provide uh, like a layer of tooling that you want consistent across so all the services that are ever generated, right? And so uh, those can be utilized to view some best practices when it comes to, you know, what kind of usage different services are taking, et cetera. Um, and it, again, goes back to the story of what tooling can you use to create those guardrails, which will, you know, not, to not topple your bill and, like, not make you have to, like, spend, like, all your money on one service that someone ran over a weekend for fun. So I think it's a lot of, it goes back to the standardization story because, Asking every developer to remember X, Y, Z, PQR will be just too challenging. Uh, of course, because the, as I was discussing, the Kubernetes landscape has new tools every second. So since I last said that statement, there might be a perfect tool that's out there. <laughs> I'm not sure of that. Um, but yeah, now another thing I would say, is at least like when you do your development in a kind of integrated environment, kind of like GitLab, uh, when people... Um, provision clusters and uh, run on uh, run those at least they have full visibility on how many po how many pods did i start like what what's going on all there within the environment where you're putting your version control or your source code so that accessibility definitely helps but that's my answer to your question which i know may not be the best one <laughs> no, no, no no that's good hey and well yeah and andy i wanted to kind of go in on that get, get in on that one as well too where um you know, there are a couple of things we've seen being done and a couple of things we've heard from, from other guests, right? Number one is the idea where if you are using, you know, you mentioned open tracing earlier or like tools like Dynatrace or anything, there's all this robust API where developers can, part, as part of their code check-in, have certain metrics and, you know, components that they're pulling in with their code executions, that whether or not they're running, writing something to write it, a compare or a diff, or someone else is having it, that can be just part of that process that you talk about can be standardized upon where this performance metrics are collected with every check-in. Um, you could even take it further, like some of Andy's uh, pipelines that he's built where he's, you know, he's, uh, you did the, the awesome one in the AWS code pipeline, Andy, and you've done it in Jenkins and some others where it's going to take the performance metrics from a test run and spin up a Lambda function to run a diff to figure out, did, was there an, imp uh, uh, an improvement or a degradation um, but then there's also things like, um, uh, and Andy, you might remember a little better than I do, when we spoke to Garenka Biedov from Facebook, where, remember with the capacity planning idea, where the developers had to, as part of their um, success failure, whether or not their, their code was going to be allowed to stay in production, they had to, with their code, check in some performance metrics that they had to meet with that code. And when they started pushing in, they did that slow rollout. And as, as it was going, if it didn't meet that, they would reject the build, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the capacity yeah. team. Um, and, and again, this is all sort of like signs of maturity, right? You're not going to have this as a very small startup, but this is where when you start those standardization, when you add in those guardrails that you're talking about and you, you, you're approaching that enterprise or, or even if we go back to, um, what was it? The, the Spartans, the, um, the Spartans of Romans. And who was the one in the middle, yeah. Andy, when we talked to uh, Emily, uh, the, the Mongols, right? Uh, the, the, the three different, well, so, so we had, uh, Emily, um, editing Emily. Yeah. Yeah. And she was talking about how there's three types of companies. You have your, your startup, which is kind of like your Spartans. The Mongols are that mid-level, not quite startup, but not quite, um, enterprise. And then the Romans, uh, you know, this is like talking from an army point of view, uh, where it's, it's, that's the, your enterprise side, but whereas the Roman army kind of operated as a bunch of small little armies all, uh, pulled in together. Um, but when you get to that level of maturity, there are definite ways you can um, add all these things in and start making it continuous. But anyhow, yeah. I think. No, I 100% agree, especially like performance metrics, right? When it comes, because so in this conversation, like we've spanned a few things. One was cost. The other was performance, right? Like. Uh, and they're totally related. 
they are related, yes, but they're like, um, you would do different things, I think, to manage both. Manage both. Right. <laughs> and so like from the performance perspective, I think just standardizing what the metrics and the alerting states are and all, there's like a whole science behind, and I'm sure you guys are more than familiar with this being Dynatrace, about how to manage your alert states, how to make sure that your the right metrics are um, you know captured and then alerted on. Um, and then where where do you pull in traces? Where do you pull in um, logs, et cetera, comes in. Um, at GitLab, it's very much like, as I said, it's a single application. So when you, you deploy to Kubernetes from GitLab, you automatically get a bunch of metrics for free, which is very nice. Um, as a, people, Some people utilize service meshes to standardize their observability story. Some people have, you know, a system working independently. But the key is, however you do it, make sure you do it. Mm -hmm. Do you have, yeah. um, um, because this is something that Brian mentioned earlier, so one of the things we've been promoting over the last couple of months is the concept of monitoring as code or performance as code or quality as, um, uh, you know, maybe you want to call it observability as code or uh, quality gates as code. So the idea is if I'm a developer uh, or a team and I'm developing a new feature, a new service, then I should also write down in code or in configuration what are the metrics that are important for me, maybe from the business perspective, later on adoption rate? What are the metrics from a performance perspective? What are the resource constraints or the resource metrics? Like how costly should my code be? And then our idea is that we write these down in a spec file, you know, in a config file. It gets version controlled with your configuration, with the other configuration files that define your uh, service definition, whatever else you have. And then as I push my code through the different pipeline stages, my pipeline makes sure that A, hey, here's a new service. Andy, the developer, wants me to check these five metrics. So let me reach out to my monitoring tools to get these metrics. Now, Andy or Brian, his performance expert, says we have some guardrails here. It should not consume more than this amount of memory, or it should not be slower than this. So let me act, you know, kind of enforce quality gates based on these metrics and so on and so forth. And in case something happens in production, then, hey, I probably want to alert whoever team is responsible for the overall business, right? So I think what we are trying to, uh, what we have been uh, discussing and promoting for different uh, implementations is a concept of, monitoring as code. We also call it performance signature. There's different terms that we've used. So we are actually trying to reach out to companies like you or people like you to really figure out how we can standardize that because I think this is another standard we need is a standardized way how we can trace and track anything related around performance, resource consumption, costs, yep. anything that could either impact the end user in a negative way or the business in a right. negative way. Right. Man. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I mean, I think, again, going out, going back to what is cloud native and all of that, the whole idea of shifting left, right, like DevOps and maybe DevSecOps even, is um, that you involve the developers more in this process of building right. And so conceptually, 100% agree. Now, in terms of finding the right standardization, um, I'd love to learn more just because, so the way we've seen it work really well from a GitLab perspective is just that you provide, um, like a lot can happen through the CICD pipelines and having, um, so GitLab CI is really popular partially for, because of that reason is like, it's really cloud native friendly and, and fast, which is nice. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's, the idea is that then a company can decide what is their set of guardrails around this. Now, when it comes to standardization, uh, are you, are you thinking like standardizing way beyond like the W3C wire protocol stuff that's happening? You're talking about specifically do A, B, C, D, and E and do it through a service mesh or put this in your CICD pipeline. Um, like which, what, what level of standardization are you talking about, I guess? No, we really want to work on a, that's the idea. And I've also presented this, um, you know, by the time of this recording, it was two weeks ago at a, um, at an event in France with our friends from Neotis. Uh, it's, it's really, I want to, we want to, uh, join forces with vendors, with 
companies because we know we have a lot of there's a lot of enterprises out there that already thought about how can we also uh, write this type of configuration down as code and and use it either for automatically setting up production monitoring or enforcing quality gates that are around around performance so what we want is really a, a standard specification uh, that as a developer of let's say cloud native microservice I, uh, that I specify, and then as I push my microservice through the different stages, my pipeline can ask my service, hey, what metrics are important for you? Uh, what are your performance requirements? What are your cost requirements? Because I, as a pipeline, I know which tools to ask to get these answers, and then, for instance, enforce quality gates or send an alert, right? So we really want to uh, we really want to work on a standard that we can then also contribute back to the Cloud Native Foundation and really say, this is the way you are developing cloud native microservices. And this is where I came to my point earlier where I said, maybe we need to come up with a, this is a way how you become a cloud native aware developer. This is what you need to do. Not only write cool code in a cool language, but you really have to also think about the specification that tells the pipeline that enforces all these guardrails on what to look for, what to alert you on, and when, and when to stop or recycle your, your your service. Got it. No, that that makes a lot of sense now that you explained it. Um, so I, as you know, like CICD is a big part of our offering, and so big believers in utilizing pipelines to do these kinds of things. I'm not sure if you've seen. Uh, um, GitLab Auto DevOps, which is a best practice pipeline, basically, um, which gets you all these like metrics out of the box and all that. So it's, I wouldn't go as far as to call it a standardization. It's more a best practice that you can edit as you want. Um, but that's kind of been our initial take at exactly what you're talking about. And so I personally, as, not just as a GitLabber, but also because I'm on the board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, I would say that some some kind of, I, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to call it a standard. I would probably call it a best practice guide um, that mm -hmm. speaks to how you can, you know, have a checklist of things that happen in your pipeline to call it Cloud Native would be super cool. Um, and since we do this auto DevOps thing already, we'd probably be in a good place to start talking about it mm -hmm. with you. Yeah, we also have, uh, and this is something. So we've we've been the the team that that I'm working with uh, for Dynatrace, the uh, Strategic Alliance Innovation Team, which just released uh, what we call uh, Captain. I'm not sure if you heard about Captain. Uh, it's spelled K E P T N dot S H is the website, and it's also K E P T N dot yeah, S H. And it's also a, um, as you said, like a best practice and also a framework behind how to uh, deploy cloud native applications. Um, and uh, the, the specification, whether it's a spec or whether it's going to be a best practice uh, that remains to be seen that I was talking about is also part of it. Very cool. Yeah, we should definitely talk further about this. And so this is something that um, Dynatrace has developed and you hope to get contributors and then uh, contribute to the foundation. Exactly. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Got it. Gotcha. And it's in the, the framework. Okay. Deployable, blah, blah, blah. And do you, it runs through the CICD pipeline, right? Exactly. That's the idea. It's also, it's, I mean, you know, we, we don't, I mean, it's just... Um, uh, we just released it, uh, so by the time of this year, when this airs, it might be a couple of weeks old already. Um, but uh, definitely a project we need to collaborate on, and I think this is why we need to join forces. Because in the end, right, what we all want, uh, obviously we all want to do business, but in the end, what we really want is we want to make sure that these enterprise organizations that are currently completely confused and overwhelmed by what's out there, I think we want to give them more guidance and more tooling, as you said as well, tooling and best practices so that their journey towards cloud native uh, becomes an enjoyable one and not a nightmare. That's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, but yes, totally open to co collaborating. So it looks like, obviously, since you're going to donate it to CNCF is um, open source, which is a key thing mm -hmm. for GitLab, as you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm happy to talk more about it. And like, you know, if, if you need to be put in touch with the right, some folks on the product side, I can do that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, well, let's see. Um, you know, we talked about cloud native for enterprises. Hopefully mm -hmm. we 
we could shed a little more light on on what this all means and especially kind of getting started tips because we know there's a lot of enterprise customers or companies out there that that have to you know adopt these uh, that have to adopt cloud native for as you mentioned earlier many many times uh, just for competitive reasons right because you need to move faster um, is there anything else um, that we that we should cover before we kind of wrap it up. Uh, I don't think so. I think this was a really fun conversation. We touched on various topics. I really enjoyed myself. I hope I didn't bore you guys to death. <laughs> no, not at all. No, not at all. No. Uh, no. And I really have to say, everybody who can, who can get a chance to see you live on stage when you're doing one of your demos and, and your, in your talks, it, it was really it was really a pleasure uh, watching you on stage and, and seeing how how modern development can really look like. So that's why you know we reached out initially. And I'm very happy that you um, did you join us today. Absolutely. I had a wonderful time. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. And uh, I think you're running a really interesting like like way of, you know, um, doing this podcast. And so I've just like had a good time here. So <laughs> I think this is great. Please keep it up. I will be listening to more of your podcast too. Great, great. So Andy, do you want to do a uh, a quick summary there? Yeah, even though I think we did a, a quick, a short summary already, but of course we stick with what we always do and we summon the summarator, right? As we yes. call him. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's do it. So, yeah, go on. Do it now. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, what I learned today and hopefully many out there learned that cloud native is, is just something we cannot ignore. It is the enabler of the future of software engineering, software delivery and software operations. And uh, there's a lot of excitement out there, obviously, for people that first see what's possible. Now, some people may then uh, drown in the realization that it's not as as easy for the environment that they are that they're living in right now. May if they are large enterprises uh, and have to deal with legacy applications and um, maybe also with a legacy mindset, which can even be more of a problem than even legacy technology. But um, thanks to what we learned today, there's obviously ways to get started, right? I think a great piece of advice is start incrementally. Don't try to boil the ocean, but find your individual projects where you're starting incrementally. I think three big interesting pieces of advice that I heard today is when you start down the journey, always make sure, and I'm quoting now you, uh, look at visibility, right? You have to have visibility into what's going on. You have to focus on ease of collaboration because that's basically the big enabler. Uh, and uh, also make sure you have to set the right guardrails. And guardrails can obviously be set in, in many different ways and, and, and forms. But when we talk about CICD pipelines, it's quality gates and there's also process guardrails. Um, but I think uh, this is you know, very great pieces of advice. And uh, the last piece I want to kind of reiterate because I like this a lot. We t we briefly talked about the purpose of autonomy because everybody wants to become more autonomous. And obviously it is it is an autonomy with that has to live within the guardrails. But I have what I really liked is, and I'm not sure if I wrote it down correctly or if you remember it correctly, but um, if you really give autonomy back to your engineering teams, you really enable them, yet you actually spur the creativity because only if you give them autonomy, they start experimenting, they start becoming creative. And with that, they are going to build features maybe that nobody ever thought about and therefore obviously, you know, supporting your business and, and bringing your business into the next level. And there's probably much more that we talked about today. Um, but I was really was really thankful that you that we had you on the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone's interested in continuing the conversation, I'm always on Twitter to a fault. <laughs> so you can find me. It's uh, twitter.com slash P for Parrot, R for Russia, I for India, T for Tango, I for India, A for Apple, N for Nancy, K for Kangaroo, A for Apple. So it's Pratyanka. I can never get my name. So I just go with that username everywhere um so yeah please find me on twitter we can catch up there and thank you once again to andy and brian for having me on the show i had a wonderful time excellent and just one last question if um andy said it's great to catch you uh speaking and, and demonstrating do you have any other uh public appearances coming up maybe uh late march april may time frame 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So um, there's a possibility I will be at GrafanaCon in uh, the next week or so uh, with a really cool panel, but that's up in the air, uh, but highly likely. Uh, and then at the Open Source Leadership Summit, I'll be speaking about uh, serverless. And uh, I'll be doing the same, um, actually not speaking, but doing a tutorial around serverless both at OzCon and Velocity. So those are the confirmed things so far. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for coming on the show today. Um, if anybody else has any questions, comments, you can find us at pure underscore DT on Twitter, or you can send an old fashioned email at, at pureperformance at dynatrace.com. I love your feedback. And if anybody wants to be a guest, let us know and we'll try to arrange it. Uh, thanks everyone. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.